Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey there, folks. It is Shay here, and we are going to be visiting with Dr. Carl Hoppy, and he is based out of North Dakota. And I really always, I always enjoy visiting with Carl as he's, if you know, if you're a longtime listener, he's been on the show before and we talked about alternative feed stuffs. But today we, while we do dive a little bit into that, we are just really talking about a lot of different factors that we can consider and think about to make sure that our cattle are receiving adequate nutrition because you can't starve your way into a profit. I believe that's the right word on that phrase. And that's something that uh, Dr. Hoppy brings up today in this conversation. But we're really talking about how we can look at new ways to affordably feed cattle. We're going to be talking about the importance of hay testing, why and when to do that. We talk about reducing feed waste. It is just like I said earlier, all about feeding those cows and finding some cost-effective ways to do it and just unique ways to consider how to do it because everyone's in a different environment. There are a lot of different options out there and it's about being creative because it's not the same cow as your grandpa had. It's not the same ranch. It's not the same economy. There are so many things that have changed. So let's look at some different options. Now with that, before we dive into the conversation, I have had lots of people reach out requesting um, kind of information about how to start a podcast. And I know there are podcasts everywhere and that's exciting. That means people are listening and people want to listen. But if you're like, hey, I think I want to start a podcast, but I just don't know if I have the time to do it, head to my website, use the contact us form, and I'll send you a free guide that's all about if you have enough time to start a podcast. And you can kind of dig through that, think through it and figure out if it's the right option for you. But with that, Let's talk about feeding those cows. Well, good morning, Carl. It's fun to have you back on the show. I know I had you on the show. Gosh, it's probably been a couple years and we were talking about alternative feed stuffs. So it's fun to have you back. And I know our paths have crossed a couple times in between there, but today we're going to be kind of talking about hay and feed testing and a few other things, depending on uh, what we decide to chat about. But to get started, since it has been a while since you've been on the show, can you kind of give the listeners a little bit of background on what you do today for your career and why you're passionate about it? Hmm. Well, good morning. Yeah, my name is Carl Hoppy. I'm an extension livestock specialist located out in the state of North Dakota at our Carrington Research Extension Center. I'm a beef cattle nutritionist by training but I deal in both cow-calf and feed yard, both in management and nutrition for North Dakotans. I uh, enjoy uh, putting on feed-out projects so people can find out how their cattle perform in a feed yard setting, so they can learn a little bit more about retained ownership, as well as uh, how well their cattle perform in a feed yard and what type of value they have in their cattle. But most of my time is spent talking about feeding livestock in North Dakota. And so what... What kind of makes you passionate about what you do? Why do you love your job and continue to stay in this career and work with producers? Why do I love my job? Well, it's because I like livestock. I, I personally have a cow herd and a sheep flock as well that I take care of after hours. I enjoy uh, uh, being involved in agriculture from a hands-on perspective. And so my real issue of why I like staying with this is solving producers' problems and issues. There's always a perspective. There's always uh, an issue that comes up that's kind of unique and different. And after being here for 34 years, uh, not too many things catch you off guard anymore. But the one about using mint as a silage, yeah, that was different. But, you know, it. Uh, I've ran across it even before. So there's a lot of different things in North Dakota that run against. Of course, extension work. Um, I always try to sum it up to people that really it's professional sales, but the only thing we have to sell is our knowledge, our education that we have, our experiences. But it's a different, it's it's a people involved uh, activity. You get to interact with a lot of different farmers and ranchers across the state, but helping them through the production issue is what we uh, strive for and enjoy. Well, that's awesome. So. A lot of times on the show, 
you know, I talk a lot about, you know, how, what practices can we shift or change to be more profitable? And a lot of times with feeding be one of the main costs that a lot of producers face, we talk about how we can spend less days feeding and more days grazing. But as you know, in North Dakota, it's really, really hard. I don't know that I personally know someone who has gone 365 days without supplementing some sort of feed to get through our winters. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about hay testing and why it's important to understand the quality of what we're feeding. So can you talk a little bit about the importance of doing those hay and feed tests before winter? Well, let me first start off. I do know of somebody who did raise, who did uh, not provide any supplemental feed for 365 days out of the year. That did happen one year, but he couldn't repeat it the second year. So like you said, North Dakota, it's a feeding world and we do have to provide feed. We don't know if it's going to be for three months or seven months in North Dakota. It kind of all depends. But as you said, feed costs are our number one issue in a cow herd. Of course, it's really important having a live calf to be able to sold off of a cow. That's almost paramount, but after that, uh, it really comes down to how can we effectively feed a cow and have her produce a good calf? You know, there's a lot to this fetal development issues. Mm -hmm. So in other words, a cow that's fed well during gestation and a calf that has enough colostrum after birth to impress upon how well they're going to gain after after, uh, after they've been weaned, it all comes together with good nutrition. And... I, I always, I, I almost, I, I almost hate to say it, but it comes down to we can't starve nutrition, we can't starve a profit out of a cow, and I've seen people try to do that. It's like no, you really can't do it. Um, you gotta, it, so we gotta feed cattle well, but we gotta figure out how to do it cheaply. So that's the challenge. We can need good feed at a low cost. And we can always put up expensive feed that's poor quality. That's pretty easy to do, and we tend to do a lot of that. But we need to look at the other way around. So a couple issues come up. This year in North Dakota, we've had an exceptional amount of rain. I mean, just perfect for growing corn, an inch of rain, or maybe a half inch of rain twice a week. Uh, So they're forever getting down. So the people that are cutting hay are getting water on top of their hay, and it is getting moldy, and it is getting poor in quality. And over the years, whenever I get to test this hay, I look at some alfalfa hay, and you're going, wow, it's it's." 18% crude protein. This looks pretty good. Well, now let's look at the energy content. It's like, wow, it's only only like 50 or 49% TDN. So I invariably ask the question, was this hay rained on? And they go, yeah, but you can tell. The rain really reduces the energy content of the hay you put up. What do we need for cow production? We need energy. We just don't need total feed. We need energy. Somehow you got to get energy into a cow. Our really good, ang- I'm carrying on here a little bit, but our really good Angus cows, I didn't say black or red. I just said good Angus cows. Hey, that's <laughs> fine. I, I, I'm I, not biased on the show. Maybe my <laughs> listeners would argue, but I try to be breed neutral on the show. <laughs> they produce a lot of milk. We have bread for milk production. Milk takes energy. Now, when you're out in grass, you don't see the, the energy drain. Unless it's been a drought and cows come off of a pasture thin, the calves come back a little less in energy and body condition. But when it comes to wintertime feeding, you got to think six months before the cow has a calf. I mean, six months ahead of time. So if she comes off a pasture short in the with shorter nutritional uh, body condition score, mm-hmm. uh, we got to feed that back on in the wintertime. So this winter feed testing, winter feed quality is a lot bigger deal than we normally think. People think, well, well, let's just go out and throw a few round bills out for the cow. It's kind of thin. She needs some energy. We'll just give them more feed because it's a cold, wintry day. No, sorry, guys. We got to look at the energy content of the feed. We always got to look at the energy content of the feed, and we tend to miss that. We don't realize how much energy our cows need. So the guys that used to raise dairy cattle live in a corn production state. They chop corn silage. What a great way to add extra energy into your hay ration. Most people say corn silage is way too expensive to go ahead and put up. But when you're looking for energy, it might be one of the cheaper sources. So I throw that out as a thought. So getting back to your original question, which was <laughs> <laughs> what type of 
uh, feed testing do we need to do? Well, of course, we need to take a, a, a random, I shouldn't say random, a representative sample of the hay or feed that we're being fed and have it sent off to a lab to be analyzed for protein and energy content, of course, calcium, phosphorus, and trace minerals as well, uh, with using near infrared spectrophotometry, NIR. It's cheap, it's quick, it does a lot of profiles of different uh, uh, nutritional items. But most importantly, I always look at is having enough energy. People usually talk about, oh, I finally, I need some extra protein for my feed. Well, you might. And there is research out there that shows that on low quality forages, in order to get more value out of your low quality forage, you need to provide extra protein. Now, that's really when you get around that five, six, seven, eight percent crude protein ration. It does benefit to have extra energy, extra protein added. But a lot of our feeds in North Dakota, like I first started out, a lot of our haze we put out in North Dakota have been uh, uh, seven, eight, nine, ten percent crude protein. So actually, on a gestating cow in the wintertime, that's enough protein. But it's not enough energy on these feeds that have been trained on or put up poor, put up late, or just put up wrong. So getting back to your question again, how do we go ahead and do it? We need to take a feed test and analyze for energy and protein content. But more importantly, look at energy content. So I now, want... <laughs> go ahead. I want to go back to, okay, so you talked about hay that's been rained on, mm -hmm. and that has been a huge thing, like you said, especially in North Dakota this year. It's been a tough year to get hay put up, but um, what you also said, you know, hay that might have been put up wrong. Do you want to touch on a few other factors during that haying process that can impact the qual the end quality of the product or the product of the or the quality of the end product, yes. I always like to start this comment out by, so I had a producer one time it, it, raising forage oats. It's an annual forage, excellent feed. And my comment usually is, as soon as you start to see the oats head out, you should probably, or, or you drive by the oats field, and you're going, hmm, I wonder if I should cut that. Don't wonder, go home, get out the conditioner and go out and mow it that day. Because invariably, it'll mature too quick and use some of your feed value as it matures. You might have more quantity, but the quality has decreased. Okay, so the guy went out and did that. And he even bragged, you know, I, I went out and cut it early, just like you said he did. Three months later, or a month later, when I drove by the field, I could see the windrows where the oats had germinated from the hay crop, from the oat crop that he had harvested in his mind early. It was mature enough to have viable seed being produced, and he thought he harvested it early. Our point is we don't harvest our feeds early enough to maintain the high quality. If you don't mind a little lower quality, sure, go ahead and, and cut it later. But if you're really looking for high quality, it's kind of like the alfalfa people. Mm -hmm. if, you're really, if you want to get 150 relative feed value alfalfa, you don't wait for one-tenth bloom. I'm not even sure if you wait for a bud, but a few days can make a big difference on the relative feed value. If you're selling it on relative feed value, days make a big difference. Not a week, days, maybe even hours. But people just, we tend to miss that because we're produce, just producing beef hay, right? No, we're trying to produce high quality feed. So you gotta cut it at an early enough maturity to make a difference for your feeds. Okay. Uh, the offset though, is that when you're dealing with rainy conditions like we are, when do we, when do we juggle the difference between poor quality hay and not having it rained on? In reality, you know, we run into that every year. Do we cut it early or do we wait a week? And I would actually say you're better off waiting a week and not getting it rained on than cutting it early and getting it rained on. On the other hand, if you waited a week this year for it not to rain, it was going to rain on it anyway. So you might as well just cut it early and just get it done. Or the real issue comes back to Cut early and cut often. You'll be better off for quality. Well, I appreciate that. And <laughs> it wasn't just uh, rain up here. There was a lot of hail, too, that was taking stuff out. So, Oh, that's too bad. Hail yeah, really but... affects your quality, too. Yeah. For uh, production like that. Yeah, there is. I mean, and just a lot of severe weather across the state, I feel like, and in other states too. But 
let's go back to the testing topic. When do you recommend producers start taking those tests so that to have that gauge before feeding comes around? Yeah. Uh, as soon as you get your hay put up, that's the best time to have it tested. At least that way you know what you have. If you're going to market it, most people that are going to buy hay or will, will want to know what your hay quality is. Of course, you have a lot of leeway there. You can either do it now or you can wait until a week before you're going to start feeding it. Usually results come back in that, that quick, within a few days. Especially with internet these days, things can come back really quickly. As long as the right address is made for your internet connection. But uh, <laughs> anyway... Um, and then when it comes to corn silage or anything that you've ensiled, you should probably let it go through the ensiling process for six weeks to eight weeks before you sample it. So my suggestion there is when you open up the pile to start feeding it, that's when you should take a sample of your silage or wet feeds. Now, if you're getting into stillers grains and that type of thing, um, it's always good to test the load. But unfortunately, sometimes we have that load fed before we get the results back. So you need to somehow get an average value, know what type of production is coming out of that plant or who you're getting it from. Different plants have different uh, techniques, or I shouldn't say techniques, but different ways to, uh, to, to work through the plant and the product comes out just a little bit different. So if you're getting feeds from different plants, you get an idea of what feed is coming out of what plant so you can average it out accordingly. But feed testing, um, you know, the hand grab sample of just grabbing some long hay, I hope we're over that phase. We should really use a probe to test haze. And just one bale isn't enough. It needs to be, my colleagues would say 12 or 20. Um, make sure you get at least a quart bag full of uh, corings to get enough for an adequate sample. And then, of course, if you've got hay from different fields, each field should be tested different if it's been... Uh, Rained on, that part should be tested different. If you know there's a difference between your alfalfa and your grass hay or your ditch hay, be sure to test all those differently because they'll come back a little bit different. So do you have producers who are taking these samples themselves and sending them in? Are they reaching out to their local extension agent or working with a feed company? Who is usually taking these samples from what you see? Um. So feed companies usually are really good about taking samples if the salesperson or their nutritionist is there to take samples. We don't have to wait for that. If you want to know what your sample is or not dealing with feed company and such, you always can't reach out to your extension specialist or county agent and they can work with you. Uh, most of them would have a coring probe, and if they don't, there's access to one at another location like my office. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll go out and probe the hay just to show you how it's done and then show you where you can purchase your own probe. And now you can go ahead and do it to your heart's content whenever you need to. You know, usually when it comes to testing hay, we're missing two things. One is the probe, okay, and the Dewalt drill to go with it because the two really go hand in hand. There are some non-drilling type drills or probes that were over that can work, but they got to really have sharp tips and they work well in alfalfa. But anyway, uh, there's different probes out there. Uh, the next thing is people would like to have, where do we send the sample to? Remember that I get the request, well, how about NDSU? Uh, we don't have a feed testing laboratory in NDSU for the public. We do for research and they'll do uh, things like crude proteins for a month. And then they'll work on ADFs for another month. Then they'll work on, so if you, you know, we could possibly do it, but it'll take you a year before you get the results back because it's research. We want the results back within a week. So we always go to a commercial laboratory. Um, there's several commercial laboratories available uh, across, well, across the, the nation, obviously. You can go to the uh, National Forage Testing Lab Association and there's a listing of laboratories that'll do testing. In North Dakota, predominantly the one that we end up going to that rolls off everybody's name, uh, it would be Dairyland Labs. They would have a prepaid mailer along with a check sheet of which things to check off of, plus a check or a credit card or a billing avenue to send it to. So it makes it really, really painless to take the sample, put in a bag already stamped with a self-addressed uh postage and and yeah the address and put it in the mail and away it goes 
then you get your results back. We've made it fairly simple that way, as long as you have the material. If you need the materials for mailers, you call the companies that you should give it to. Now in North Dakota, we do have some other labs that will uh, do the feed analysis. And if you're located next to them, you can just drive over and drop it off and they can probably do the analysis. Um, like all things, I always look at it this way. So if you have cancer, you want to go to a cancer doctor specialist, right? Not just a general practitioner. So if you're trying to do feed analysis, you probably want to go to a lab that does feed analysis routinely, like every day. So by the same token is sometimes their feeds, we're looking for nitrate issues, which are toxic issues. And when I talked about feed quality, I didn't talk about, I talked energy and protein, vitamins and minerals. I didn't talk about things like nitrates that are toxins. Uh, we can do that at NDSU at our veterinary diagnostic lab, or a feed laboratory can do that, or maybe some of these other labs can do it as well. There's actually a rapid test that your local county extension agent can do well, if you're really curious about it. Uh, for the most part, those are uh, presence or absence. And a lot of times in a drought condition or stress conditions, it'll be positive. So nitrates are always a concern. Just balance it accordingly. Some plants are accumulators. So you mentioned earlier, you know, you really emphasized taking that representative sample and taking samples of, you know, different fields, mm -hmm. hay that is um, comprised very much noticeably going to be different just by, so what other mistakes could producers potentially make during the testing process? What are some common mistakes you see that might be made outside of maybe not taking their representative sample? Uh, the, what we tend to like to do is uh, grind hay and blend the two together. And we get our three or four different, we'll take a bale of this, plus a bale of this, plus a bale of this other feed and grind the three together. And we have a big pile. And now we want to sample the pile because we just ground our hay together. We should really analyze each bale or each pile type of hay before we grind them together rather than afterwards. So the mistake I see is trying to take a hand grab of ground hay to have an amp, to have a to have a representative sample of your ground hay pile. So think about this. When you're looking at ground hay pile, you almost see rivers of feed coming down the side. Sometimes you'll see a and I by river kind of you can see there's long stem hay coming on one side, really fines of alfalfa coming down to another spot. And it skews your feed analysis depending upon where you take your hand grab sample out of that pile. <clears throat> and trying to use a probe in a ground hay pile, that just doesn't work. So you have to figure out a way to do it. The other thing is, um, so you take these 20 samples, you put them into a five gallon bucket, and then you have to blend them together, right? And you want to take a sample, a subsample out of that for analysis. Well, when we blend it together, a lot of those fines go to the very bottom of the feed bunk, uh, of the bucket. So you no longer have a representative sample now when you've made a change in what the feed looks like or what, how it's going to be. So trying to get that representative sample is a real big deal. Don't let all the fines fall on the ground unless you normally have all the fines fall on the ground before the cattle eat it. So that's the other thing. Test what's in the feed bunk because that's what the cattle are consuming. Um, you can actually test what the cattle didn't consume in the feed bunk to give you an idea of what type of stuff they're leaving. Uh, and that's another issue. It comes down to feed waste and feed lost um, in a feed bunk or just feeding out on. It, you know, it's always fun to feed out on the ground and grass, but the amount of loss that we have and feed on the grass or even on the snow in the wintertime, it's more than what people think. So with that, I've also heard that that's adding back, you know, cover or organic matter to maybe if there were areas that needed it. What's your take on that? Because I know personally, like when we would, like I grew up feeding a TMR to cows and there would be bales in the feeder and but we mostly tried to put bunks out there or have a fence line feeder so that there was not as much waste so I guess let's talk about that hay waste a little bit 
So when our research extension center here at Carrington, uh, we have a dry lot cow herd. It was put together 40, 50 years ago to actually uh, investigate cows grazing irrigated forages. Of course, at that time, the cows, those old Hereford cows walked out there and trampled down most of the grass and they went, oh my gosh, we're losing half our feed because it's trampled on the ground. We should just harvest it all and haul the feed into the cows and, and meter it out that way. Nowadays, we'd say that's great because we just added more organic matter to the soil. So times have changed. Okay, so you're right. That is adding organic matter to the soil, but I got a better solution for you. Let the cows poop on the soil and provide the urine, the organic matter that way. Don't do it with just the rough feed. Let, let, let them get out of the feed bunk first and they use the urine and the feces to enhance our soils, not just feeding it on the ground first. So what are some just basic feeding strategies that you're seeing producers utilize to reduce feed waste? You know, there's obviously hay feeders or bunks if you're feeding a TMR. Um, what about limit feeding or are there other options? What else are you seeing being utilized to reduce feed waste? Yeah, um, feed bunks always work the best of some type. A totally mixed ration certainly works, works well. Um, the efficiencies of totally mixed rations are, are right there. You know what the weight is that you're feeding. You know what the blends are. Things work out well. But I always have to throw this point out to the people that don't have a TMR. And that is, it costs money to grind hay, and it costs money to have a TMR, uh, the mixer wagon, and to run two tractors. So you can afford to have some feed loss waste because of the costs, but you need to know what your costs are before you get into that argument. So if you only have 30 cows, it might be cheaper to go ahead and let the cows waste 10% of your hay bales or 20 or 30% of your hay bales uh, rather than uh, using a TMR just because of the cost of equipment. Of course, if you're wasting 30% of your hay, that's actually considered bedding too, right? So that might be some expensive bedding if you're paying $100 a ton for your hay when you could buy $40 a ton hay, uh, straw for bedding or stover. Uh, all those good. Prices all change. What's available? Um, but I've seen some self feeders uh, for hay feeders, hay rings. Um, for me, it seems like uh, when you put one bale in a two bale hay feeder, that kind of reduces the waste. Doesn't make sense that we should have a one bale for one bale feeder, but yeah, it seems like they just, but they still will waste. High quality hay, cattle don't waste. Poor quality hay, cattle will waste. Grinding hay that's poor quality will reduce your feed wastes, waste, ding. But on the other hand, uh, we need to get the energy into the cows. So need to balance that ration accordingly to what the energy is for what you put up. And that's the most challenging. I like feed bunks. Fence line feed bunks are nice. Um, feeding out in the area is nice too. Tugs, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Rubber tubs, tires turned inside out. Yep. Uh, yeah, on the ground, uh, anything so it's not falling into the ground. I seen some data that was with putting distillers grains on the ground. If I remember correctly, it was like 30% loss. If you put... Just even though a cow licked the heck out of the ground trying to get to the distillers, there's still loss into the soil that just disappears that you can't get to. So be really wary of feeding losses, feeding out in the ground, even on top of snow. Cattle trample into the feed, trample it into the feed. And that's I'd rather move feed bunks every few days than to have feed loss that way. So kind of circling back. You know, earlier you had talked about, you know, you kind of put a plug in for corn silage as an option. Um, and you had talked about how forage oats can be a good feed option. What are some other feed options that you're seeing to produce that quality forage or quality feed, um, maybe at a lower cost than traditional methods or just kind of how are you seeing producers be creative and try new things with their rations? Well, it's this thing called the crop insurance that really <laughs> makes things confusing. 
So when you have preventive plant where we can't get into the field, but yet, oh my, we got to put some type of a cover crop on top but that we can't take for grain, but that's better for soils to put something on that field and then we can hay it or graze it. That is probably the most unique thing. What's people normally use on saline soils? It's going to be barley. They always wonder about putting millets and sorghums on because you're seeding it after it's dried out, hopefully. Um, uh, yeah, in hot weather. So they're looking at a warm season forage to grow. Uh, that certainly can work. Dry down is always a bitch, though. Is one of those warm season forages available to dry down October? What's the weather like in October? Hopefully, you know, it's usually not, it's, yeah. We in never and know. out of snow, you never know. <laughs> yeah, well, we might have our late frost this year in December, so it's hard to tell what we're going to have. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe it'll be in September, I don't, yeah. So that's a challenge you run into is, is uh, feeding things. Um, people always look for some type of production, but lower cost to seed to. So I always get this question, what about forage sorghums? Because the feed is quite a bit, the seed is quite a bit cheaper than your $100 an acre for seed corn. So with that in mind, um, you can either do forage sorghums or you can do a sorghum sedan grass hybrid that's a little finer stemmed. So the forage sorghums get 10, 12 feet tall. They just produce a lot of tonnage. Unfortunately, they don't produce much feed energy. So if you need tonnage, it's great. If you need quality, mm, if you do the feed testing, you'll find out that that may not have been a good decision for you. On the other hand, uh, using the sorghum sedans certainly could work, um, but they're usually really wet and you'd have to cut them and let them dry uh, for weeks to get them to, and then of course there's regrowth too. So it'll grow back in the windrow and there just gets to be those type of problems. So you see the annual forages like oats and barley uh, coming back into play. Now there are other things like winter rye or winter wheat, Willow Creek winter wheat, uh, which is a forage wheat, an onless wheat that grows quite tall. So, you know, there's other things like that that are out there that we can, plant in the fall for harvest next spring or summer. Um, so at least we're not bound up uh, trying to plant them in the springtime or trying to do the rest of the crops. Um, grazing rye is always a good thing. Okay, whether it be in the fall or being in the spring, that certainly works. You do have to worry though, because well, as soon as the rye plant starts to bolt, produce a head, your feed quality immediately drops. Cattle don't like to eat it either. So if you're looking to make it a hay crop, you might have to spike it with silage or alfalfa or anything else, maybe distillers to get them to want to eat it too. There's always this uh, consumption issue, but as long as it's a lush vegetative plant, the sugar content is so high, cattle will just love to eat it and will withstand heavy grazing as well. So I don't know, I talked about a lot of different issues there, but maybe there's one that really stands out. And is this the time that you always use some of your own personal experiences and share that? And I have found out that for me, raising corn silage is the cheapest source of energy for a cow herd. And a little bit of corn silage can really improve the feed quality of the haze that we put up, even in this rainy conditions that we have. Back in the old days, when we chopped corn with two row choppers, and it took three weeks and a neighborhood to go ahead and cut your silage, I can see why everybody moved away from that type of intense work. Yeah, it was time consuming. And nowadays with the type of uh, corn choppers that we have, you know, the million dollar machines, they can gobble a lot of and process a lot of feed in a short amount of time. If you can just get the guy to show up to chop your feed, you'll have a lot of feed show, a lot of good quality feed put up in a short amount of time. And even though it has a cost, um, wow, what a feed resource to have. So that's my little spiel on corn silage. If you ask me off to the side, I'll always go ahead and say, that's a really cheap source. No matter what the cost is, that can be a really cheap source of energy for our feed. Although producers that raise grain will say, I'd rather sell the corn grain than I would the silage to my cows. So we got to figure out a different way to feed them cows. And of course, in North Dakota, we do have an alternative, and that is co-products. Our wheat mids, our distillers grains, soy hulls, uh, beet pulp. We have, uh, well, corn gluten feeds kind of took up by the dairies, but 
We have a lot of different feed resources available in North Dakota that other states don't even have. And we all ship it out of state because we don't use it all here in North Dakota. But uh, it's an option. It certainly is. Absolutely. Well, Carl, as we kind of wrap up today, do you, what are your final thoughts? Or um, if there's one thing you want producers to take away from this conversation, what would that be? Be sure to feed test your haze. I know one year, if you do it one year, you say, oh, I tested it last year. I don't need to do it this year because it's all kind of the same. Now, you really should get in the process of uh, the soil test. Be sure to feed test too. Tells you what's going on. And the thing I do want to impress upon people is that the type of cows you raise now aren't the type of cows that grandpa remembers. And our feed requirements are a lot different than what they would be. And since we feed every day, we don't see the changes of poor quality as easily as what somebody that would come and look at your cows every year would look at them and say, yeah, they're kind of thin. And when they say they're kind of thin, that means they're starving. So you really should try to feed them better. But remember, it takes six months to make a difference. So if you're going to improve your feeding, your feeding ration for the winter, you need to do it all winter, just not a couple weeks before calving. All right. Well, thanks for visiting with me today and coming back to be a guest on the show. And that's a wrap on that one. If you like this episode, be sure to share it on your social media. Send me a DM, rate and review, however you want to communicate with me, because if you don't tell me what you like or don't like, I can't uh, make content that's better for you. And I love to create content and have guests on for you. And if you have a topic idea that you really want to hear about or a cool guest, send that my way too. I'd love to hear from you and hear who's listening. So with that, happy ranching, and we'll catch you on the next one.